What is going on, Hot Take Nation? It is DRW here for another episode of the Hot Take of the Day podcast. Uh, today, we're going to get into a whole bunch of topics with my man, Dick Massimilian. What is going on, Dick? I love the headphones so much. You're rocking them. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Um, and so we got the black, we got the black tarp going behind you uh, for lighting. And uh, what are you hiding behind there? I mean, everyone can see what I got going on in the basement in Grandma's house. But what do you got going on there? I am in a I'm in an office building in downtown Dallas, and I'm at the offices of uh, uh, of a, a company that I work with called Frozen Fire. So I'm in one of their offices, and I thought, uh, you know, I was going to do this from home, but I've got several dogs and i thought you know they'll bark and so came down here i love it and so dick why are listeners tuning in what are they going to hear about today you said give them a little introduction to yourself we know each other a little bit but would love to hear the background so listeners know what they're going to what they're in store for in the next hour all right so my wheelhouse is leadership development and my uh what i my uh, leader my slogan is great leadership is no accident. So I work with organizations, teams, and individuals. So uh, on, on leadership, for an organization, that means do you have the people in place you need to achieve your strategy now and into the future? For a team, it, makes ma it means making better decisions together faster. And for an individual, it means being as personally effective as he or she aspires to be. So that's my, that's my primary wheelhouse. Um, and I've worked in it for almost 30 years. But I also am a small business owner. So I have that additional perspective. Uh, together with my wife, we own and operate a luxury home cleaning company in Dallas called Highland Park Housekeeping. So I'm a small business owner and I'm a leadership development guy. How is the cleaning business these days? I imagine it must be absolutely crazy. It, uh, when COVID hit, it uh, suddenly was cut in half because uh, ev nobody wanted uh, cleaning crews. We send crews of two people you know, in company vans to clean people's residences. So COVID hits and all of a sudden the business is cut in half and we're having to let people you know, we're, we're trying to figure out, uh, you know, who can work, who can't. Now it's gone the other way. With people home, you know, everybody's home, the kids are home, homeschooling, it's gone the other way. And now the demand is uh, uh, far exceeding the supply. And so we're ramping back up as fast as we can, trying to hire people as fast as we can. And it's a challenge. What's what's the biggest challenge on hiring? You hear these rumors about people don't want to go back to work because, you know, up until July 31st, the unemployment benefit was obviously big and, and people were making 2400 bucks a, a month not working. Was that what you were finding or was it, is there other reasons? Is it is it fear? Is it health? Is it well, what are the causes that people don't want to go work? I honestly think something <laughs> definitely changed the moment this extra $600 a week ran out, David. Something definitely changed and uh suddenly we started getting more applicants but uh for a lot of people the the incentive to work is just not there so uh uh we're it's it's turned the corner lately but i think that's a lot of the challenge people just people actually it isn't necessary there's there's plenty of government assistance um i also think part of it is uh kids going back to school and I think that, you know, right. And so then people sort of said, well, I'm going to take the summer, but now it's September. My kids are back in some semblance of normality. So it's time for me to hit the hit, get back to work. Time for me to, to, to go back to work. And so uh, uh, hopefully the schools will remain open. Uh, um, I think there's a lot of COVID fatigue setting in. I, I mean, uh, for sure. And it, it is interesting in the last two weeks, like, 
you're definitely seeing it. I, I, I noticed that the restaurants in, in Denver, certainly, you know, not downtown, because who the heck wants to go downtown? There's nothing but homeless encampments and spray paint. But in Cherry <laughs> Creek, for instance, like the restaurants are absolutely packed. And, and I, I hung out with a, a restaurant owner yesterday, and he said that the best thing for their business, especially in Denver right now with the weather, is that they actually are at 110% of capacity because they're able to use the street. And so, you know, he his view was, you know, realistically, they're not going to change the capacities for restaurants until there's a vaccine, which to me is insane. But beyond that, they're able to get the capacity at least now before the winter. And he says, as long as I have my bar, the bar adds energy. And even if I space people apart, when people are there and congregating and like it, it feels pseudo more normal, then people are kind of excited and, and you know, for those who are scared, stay home. And for those who want to go out, they, they follow the rules. They wear the mask at the table and off they go. So, so COVID COVID fatigue is a great way to describe that. Yeah. And plus importantly in our town, football season, which was delayed is going to start. It's going yes. to start in a couple of weeks. That is an enormous boost on a whole number of levels. I mean, sports bring people together. Uh, well, Usually, but uh, or or they bring them, they 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 focus you on something other than, and they give you something to look forward to, and quite frankly, hope. And one of the things I know we'll talk about with companies and leadership, and but I, I found that that for me anyway, my hope in the world had dimmed over the last six months, and it was leaking away from me. And the more that I would see, there are woke people, and I was an awake person. And I was seeing the impact of the economy and, and everything that was going on. And my hope was diminishing. But I look forward to watching sports. I look forward to the golf tournaments. I look forward to the hockey games. I even, against my wishes, watched three minutes of a basketball game yesterday because I just uh -huh. like watching athletes perform at their best level in a pure meritocracy. That's what I love. So um, sports is a great one, too. Yeah. Yeah, it'll, it's just, you know, it's, it's gonna, like I said, it's gonna be an enormous, enormous boost in terms of morale. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, I'm going to go to the high school football games, even though my uh, kids are, my boys are out of the, they've, they're out of that, but uh, I'm going to go back just because it's for the just community. Just because you can, I totally agree. Okay, okay. so. So we talked about um, executive coaching and leadership and, and all that. I wanted to. How much is obvious? You know, when you go in and you work with a client, like how much do people know and, and they have self-awareness and they're like, I understand what the issues are. I just need a facilitator versus how often are you actually like pointing out the challenges? Well, walk me through like that first relationship and what you see typically in organizations and have things been like exacerbated through COVID or are they less so? What have you seen and how do you approach a client the first day? Well, the first thing um, with leadership development is that the first thing is what you're trying to do is elevate somebody's self-awareness because it's pretty much axiomatic in, in our business now that the, the higher a person's level of self-awareness, the better, the more effective they're going to be as a leader because they'll make more decisions consciously and fewer unconsciously. So then the question becomes, all right, how do you then elevate a person's self-awareness? So I, you know, like many, I will go in and I will do a leadership assessment and I will talk to them about their leadership journey to date. But then I'll, uh, I'll talk to them about their aspirations, but then I'll talk to them a little bit, I'll, I'll, I'll try and get a handle on their interpersonal style and there are varying, instruments you can use to try and get a handle on somebody's interpersonal style. So what you're looking for is things that come naturally to the person and things that don't. And so that's, that's where you begin. Then of course, you talk to the person's boss, then you'll, you know, sometimes you do a 360. I do them by talking to people. I don't like to do them online. Right. So that's that's a little bit of where you start with a person. So let me give you an example, if I may. Of, yeah, of, please do. What do I mean by, you know, how, so let's talk about um, how somebody approaches the world. And I use many things, but one of them 
is an instrument based on the work of Carl Jung. And uh, it's called the Myers-Briggs Type Inventory. And it's, I like it because it's simple. And Jung said there are fundamental preferences for how you, that we're born with, that we are each born with for how we take in information and then we, how we use it to make decisions. And so his work, he's a you know, Swiss psychiatrist about 1900, 1910. And so his work was adapted by two, uh, a mother-daughter team, uh, uh, Catherine uh, Myers and Isabel Briggs. And um, uh, they uh, got an instrument. So now what does this instrument measure? First of all, how do you approach the world? So do you direct your energy, do you direct your energy outward or do you direct your energy inward? And that's the example. extrovert introvert measure. That's right? extroverts introverts. Now people get confused on this, um, and I've done the Myers Briggs before, and and I hear different things about extroverts. I hear extroverts are people who get energy from other people, and I also hear that extroverts are people who exude a huge amount of of energy. How do you think about extrovert versus introvert in in the the Jungian um, form? Extroverts think out loud. They, 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 they're, they tend to be sociable. They tend to be gregarious. They have a wide range of interests. And um, uh, an extrovert will be the guy that you're negotiating with who says, let's talk it through, then we'll put it in writing to confirm. The introvert directs energy inward. They don't think out loud. They think, they process internally. They tend to have, they tend to be private and contained. They tend to have fewer interests, but deeper interests. The introvert will be the guy you're negotiating with who says, put it in writing, let me look it over, and we'll talk about it. Right. Now, the important thing with the Myers-Briggs is, we're talking only about preferences. You know, only about preferences. You got to operate in both. The other thing that's very important to remember, he believed in what's called a bimodal distribution, like two humps, mm -hmm. not a bell curve. So, so that there's a, a whole bunch of extroverts. There's some people who operate in the middle, but very low level. Uh, and, and then a whole bunch of introverts. So that's the bimodal yeah. concept. It, bimodal means you're, you're one or the other. It's heads or tails. And you, you prefer one, it's your home base. I mean, the way to think about this, David, is you and I both type with both hands, yes? Yes. We both type, but that doesn't mean we're ambidextrous. Any day of the week, you give me a coffee cup or a pen or anything, I'm gonna reach for it like I am now with my right hand. Right. Could I take it with my left? I could, but that's not my home base and what Jung, why I love it is it tells people, all right, what's your home base? And so extrovert, introvert becomes important when somebody's leading people. The extrovert boss is the guy who naturally goes out and, you know, walks the hall and is in touch with people. So if, the, if he's managing or she's managing an introvert, and the introvert doesn't come into the to talk to them, they're gonna say, <clears throat> what's the deal? My door's open. Well, no, you gotta go there. Conversely, the introvert boss will be, you know, who managing an extrovert, the extrovert will knock on the door, say, can I talk to you? The introvert boss will say, sure, come on in, probably thinking, hurry up and let's get this over with so that I can go back to work. Right. And the introvert boss needs to realize, no, you are working. Okay. And so the introvert boss, there's many examples like that. So that's the first one. Yeah. And so Ben, we'll go, we'll go through the other three. Cause I think it's fascinating when you, when you talk about like those preferences and how people like the, the, the it all comes to self-awareness and, and what leadership is and what leadership should be. And if you're an introvert, you have a natural style and you're for an extrovert. Is there, is there a general, it seems to me extroverts, and I'm obviously an extrovert. It seems to me extroverts would be better bosses, 
for some of the time when there's a crisis and, and when people need communication and when people need rallying. But when things are stable, an introvert would probably be a better boss. Is that a fair uh, assessment or is that is that too grandiose in your view? I, I would actually not say that. I do think it depends entirely on, on the situation and what you're going through. Um, I think... I think in the virtual meetings world we're suddenly in, extroverts and introverts each have different challenges. Extroverts, suddenly there's not the hall talk, they can't go visit with people. But introverts are going to find themselves in meetings all day on the phone and they're going to be exhausted. So I think uh, uh, it's just going to depend entirely on situations and companies it is true that ex extroverts and introverts tend to gravitate towards particular professions, but that's far from a universal truth. Interesting. Okay, so let's go through the, the next, the next Myers-Briggs element. Yeah. Sensors. They're, they're, so this has got, got to do with how you take in information. How do you take in information? Do you start from, do you start with what's in front of you? What's factual? What, you, you know, I call this the realm of what's so. Do you start from the specific facts and build thoroughly towards conclusions and approach the big picture this way? So here to here, I call that, that's called sensors. Your, your primary home base is what's in front of you, facts. Then there's intuitives. Intuitives, they start with the big picture and they go in this way. <clears throat> the first question a sensor is going to have is, what have we got? The first question an intuitive is going to have is some version of, why do I care? Okay, what is the big picture? So it, I'm, for instance, an intuitive. I, you know, I, here's, a, here's how to think of this. If a sensor and an intuitive go into a museum and they see a painting for the first time, the first question, the sensor is going to be drawn to the color, the texture, the details. You know, that's where the sensor is going to go. Where's the intuitive going to go? What is this a picture of? Right. And so, I, I always get confused, and, and I, I try and remember when I did the Myers Briggs what I was. And I think I, I think I, 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 I perceived that I was an S, but when you describe that, I'm pretty sure I'm an N. Um, but do you find that in this level between the sensing and the in, intuition, are people more like is it less bimodal than introvert extrovert, or is it the same? Well, people t people definitely have a preference. So, for instance, although I'm an intuitive. I, I'm big on specifics, big on specifics. I want details. I hate it when people make general statements. I always want to dive into, okay, what exactly are we talking about? That's one of my first questions. Yeah. But before I get there, I want to know what's the frame for this discussion and what, what are we talking about? What's the point? If you're working for somebody who's you got a sensor boss you can go in and say hey i was reviewing our master services agreements and i was on page 16 and i happened to notice the language you use to define timely payments with vendors and it says in the language that okay a sensor is fine with that you do that with an intuitive boss you lost them. Yeah, I just already. about fell asleep in that one sentence. Yeah. So, yeah, that 100% best, best definition you, ever. Intuitive, you better start with, I think we got to redefine timely payment. Here's why. I was looking at our contracts, blah, 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 blah. And where you get a lot of agita in organizations is um, intuitive bosses, uh, uh, people come in and they want to give them the story or – the uh or and they're like i don't want the story tell me tell me the details that matter and let's like give me the macro so i can make a decision give me the macro so you got what so that's the sensor and you got so what 
that's the that's the intuitive and um, um, sensors tend to be like engineers, for example, tend to uh, um, uh, and intuitives kind of it really could be anything actually. So it's just where are you starting with the details or the big picture? Okay, so then the third one. The third one is very interesting. The third one is thinking and feeling. Okay, thinkers. So now you've taken in the information, how do you use it? A thinker steps back from a problem, applies logic and analysis, looks for a rule to apply, and then, and then wants, wants to apply that rule, a, the first home base for a thinker is consistency. And a thinker defines fairness as everyone is treated the same. Feelers, <clears throat> not so. Feelers, the opposite. They don't step back, they jump right in. First thing they deploy is not logic, it's empathy. What's, the, home, what's, what's empathy? I've, I've heard, I've heard empathy of this is, word, I've, uh, but I don't, I'm not familiar I'm with gonna, the concept. I'm going to give you a bad definition, but it'll communicate. Empathy is I feel your pain. I understand what it's like to walk in your shoes. I get it. I get how you feel. Hence the term. I, yeah. you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's you, you dive in and you want to, you're after harmony. Um, you, so you jump right in. You want to solve that particular problem. And what you're after, fairness for a feeler is not everyone's treated the same. Fair, fairness is everyone's taken care of. Everyone is taken care of. So, so am I, I mean, this is going to be, again, a general statement, which you already cleared, cl made clear that you don't like generalizations. But, but I think about the COVID time, which is where we started this conversation. And, and that just, you know, take politics out of it, but let's use Myers-Briggs. I would imagine that thinkers are really struggling because there's not consistency. There's changing logic. There's no rules. There's everything. So, so thinkers are in an, an extremely uncomfortable place. And then feelers on the other, on, you know, incrementally are also in an uncomfortable place because they're concerned about every single citizen and how can every single citizen be saved? And, and, and they're, they're diving right in and they're like, this is bad. This is a pandemic. We need to save the whole world. And so they're feeling like this huge burden of empathy and thinkers are feeling this burden of of inconsistency is is yeah. that is that a fair way to maybe characterize how people like how people are feeling about this yeah i would say it is fair i would say also that um a couple things first of all if you look at what so a lot of what you hear from covid is from the media and from the press and i personally have a theory do I think more thinkers or more feelers go into journalism? Feelers. I, no question. 100%. 100%. Because they're not doing, they're writing. And then again, not they're writing in English. And, but, yeah. but there's math and the, and the studies of, of science. And then there's writing in the, and communication. And, yeah. and you know, certainly Daniel Martino Booth, who we had on the show, w did journalism coming out of an investment banking career. And she said, even as a journalist, she's like, well, you people have no idea what you're writing about and you're yeah. picking like the one exception. And yes, totally agree. To and, that's, and that's where a lot of the problem is. Now, here's the thing that I tell my the leaders that I'm working with. If you're a thinker talking to a feeler and you want to persuade him or her, do not use logic because they don't speak logic. So don't say this doesn't make sense. It's inconsistent. It's, you know, uh, um, I had a situation once in a big pharmaceutical company there. I'll do it quickly. There were six people and they, uh, they were like the inside sales force for, um, for, uh, for fulfilling requests. So if somebody promises to give something to a doctor, these people send it out. So <clears throat> you have six people 
And the rule was you work in the office, you know, just for a lot of reasons, cover each other and so on. One day I come in and one of the five is not there. And I said, where's, I'll call her Sally. And I, and, and, and the person, HR person says, oh, Sally's mother broke her hip and she's gonna work from home for three months. So I said, oh, now I happen to be working with Susan. And I know Susan has a five month old baby and would like nothing more than to work from home. So I say, oh, well, how, what about Susan? And the, the person says, well, what about her? I said, well, she's gonna want, you know, how's she gonna feel about that? My, the answer was, well, if she comes to me, I'll deal with it at that point. And then I said the thing I never should have said, but I was young and dumber than I am now. I said, that makes no sense. What I should have said was, oh, how do you think Susan's going to feel, feel about that? Yeah. When she hears that's the way to go. Flip it. Never, if you're, and I work with a lot of people, HR, for, and, but others. Morale is down. People are really, you know, her, you know, blah, 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 blah. And they want to go get it addressed. I said, okay, don't go to the, your, your boss, who I happen to know is a, is a thinker. Don't say morale is down and people are uncomfortable. Say, we have, we have workload issues, which if we don't address, are going to cause turnover, which is going to cost us money we can't afford. Right. So if you're a thinker, talk to a if you're a thinker talking to a feeler, speak feeler. If you're a feeler talking to a thinker, talk talk thinking. Right. So now here we have COVID. You have a whole host of people saying, wait a minute, there's comorbidity. The CDC says only 9,000 of all the deaths have no comorbidity. Where, there's the economy, it's logic. And you're talking to people who all they, their priority is, yeah, but what about granny who lives in a multifamily everyone always family. goes to grandma every which is which is crazy i mean it's I, and and you you explain exactly why and and the way to deal with it and that is i think the greatest thing about both self-awareness and the myers-briggs test is to know what you are and to then be able to interpret what others are so that you're able to better communicate with them on terms that they can understand to be more persuasive which is the end goal exactly it's ex exactly right so because you know what you are you look out you can see what other people are so for instance my daughter my i'm a thinker my daughter is definitely a feeler she's a she teaches sixth grade in a school in dallas 92 percent of the kids are on um like uh, says, says free and reduced lunch or yes, whatever they call yeah, that. it. Yeah. Yeah. 92%. So she's looking at this thing and it's, and she's, she looks at the whole world of education and she is the impact on my kids. They're trying so hard, you know, I mean, and so that's the language she speaks. Um, I speak, I mean, I'm with her, but mine is, do we have any clue what the societal cost of this is? Right. Or, or, you know, or, then we are fairness or what have you. And um, um, so that's, you know, that's it, the, you know, the thinking and the feeling and, um, you know, it, uh, uh, we could, and then this thinking and feeling thing in the political realm, and we could, we're really oh, yeah. off to the, off to the races. So really let, let's, the, before we get into that, let's talk about the fourth one so that our listeners can have a full sense and we're going to tie it all back to self-awareness. Yeah. Fourth, it's the, the terms are not great. One's called judging, one's called perceiving. Think of it instead as judging is scheduled, perceiving is flexible. So for Ooh, me, the light just went crazy the in the light, background. The, the light just went down the background. Um, 
Uh, we're all good. It, we're all good. Okay, we're good. Yeah, it, uh, I think the timer went down. or uh, I, I haven't moved enough. I should wave my hands. It's like, um, it's like a, now it's like an episode of the Blair Witch Project over there in, uh, in <laughs> Dallas. It's like, <laughs> I don't even, I don't even remember the movie. I just remember crazy people walking through the dark and I knew the bad things were going to happen. So I hope that doesn't happen in the rest of the episode. But okay, I interrupted you. Perceiving versus judging. Yeah, judging, judging, judging. Uh, me, schedule. We are scheduled. We plan. For, uh, for, for a judging person, a deadline occurs as, uh-oh, let me get ahead of this. I want everything structured. I plan. So if we're going on vacation with my family, I'm going to say, oh, we're landing Tuesday, Wednesday. Let's book this tour. Wednesday night, let's make, you know, it's, it's very planful. So would, would people be called type A? Like if you're judging, would that, would that be inner, inner, most people would have called someone if you're a type A personality, are you a judger generally? I used to think that I no longer think that because I have a couple of clients that are perceiving that no way you would not consider them type A's. Okay. <clears throat> the perceiving, the perceiving CEO perceivers, they like flexibility, optionality. Whereas a judging person's first question is, how soon can I make this decision? The perceiving person's is, when's the last possible moment I can make this decision so I can spend as much time gathering information as I can? Well, that's, that's interesting. That, that feels at the same, you, you know, you had me as, as I was thinking about myself, and, and I think I came out as a P when I did it. But when you talk about like I don't I'm not structured, but I like to not procrastinate and I like to I like to make quick decisions based on the data, which I think comes from the T. Um, but when you just said that, it, it, it's interesting again. And this is the preferences is is that you might be preferring this or preferring this, but you ultimately have the ability to move back and forth. Yeah, it's again, it's home base. Home base for me is. Deadlines are a source of stress. If I have something due Friday, I want it done Wednesday night. Perceivers, and it's hard for me to even describe because I so can't relate to it sometimes. <laughs> they Deadlines are not uh-oh for them. Deadlines are an adrenaline rush. Right. And literally, their brains are such that a deadline mobilizes their best thinking. My grad school roommate wrote his paper that was his entire grade for a semester in the last 72 hours. Yeah, that and was me, 100%, 100%. Brilliantly, brilliantly, brilliantly. And I could never say, Wayne, what are you doing? He said, well, I don't know, but he, that's just how he did it. And huh. um, he said, well, my, I, my, I get my best thinking at the end. And I said, well, why can't you get your best thinking like in early December, why are we, no. You know, it was just, it's just the wiring. So where this is fun is some people that like flexibility, if your boss likes flexibility and you like making decisions, you better take a deep breath and learn patience because your boss is going to uh, um, uh, uh, drive you crazy. I mean, just one example, and in a lot of my oil industry clients, the guys that set the rig schedule, they're all J's. They want it set. The reservoir engineers, they like changing. Oh, right, we, right. we got better EURs. Here we go. Right. You know, and, it, and it's like, it's the constant dance of, do you like to be scheduled or do you like flexible? The flexible person you set, goes on vacation and says, well, I'll get up in the morning and see what I feel like doing. You know, the, you know, well, we'll figure it out. The judging person says, uh, no, beach nine to 12, lunch 12 to one, biking, whatever. Like right. That. Well, so, so I can be, so I'm going to do a self-diagnosis and, and, and remember, so I am an ENTP. Yes, I, I would and, say that. And, and you are. And e I know. You, ENTJ. J. ENTJ. Okay. So, so let's, let's come back to what you talked about at the beginning was this concept of self-awareness. And, you know, one of the things that I, I really uh, value about the podcast is it's taught me to be a better listener than I was when I was working. And, and I think because in the Myers-Briggs comfort level, 
I would take in the macro picture, I would look at the logic and I would come up with a decision and I didn't always do everything to bring people along. And I probably was, I was already at Z and, and this is what a lot of people who've worked for me and with me know. I was already there and they're like, how the hell did you get there? And it would take like a month or two months before people saw all the pieces, which is again, an, an issue with, with COVID, with me prognosticating what the issue was in oil and gas. Like I was 18 months ahead and I didn't, I didn't communicate to people who weren't ENTP in the way that I could have to be more empathetic, more understanding, more allow people to come with me. The podcast made me a better listener and, and has allowed me to be more reflective as a self-aware person. How many leaders start out as self-aware or become self-aware later in their career? I would, I would sense that most people racing up to get to the top don't really have a lot of self-awareness at the beginning. They're more like bulls in a china shop. And it isn't until later in their career they're settled down. Is that a fair assessment from um, what you've seen in your career? Two things. I think self-awareness is always a journey. And I think we're all on it. We're never not on it. And you're always learning more. But what I would say about leaders is early in your career, you, you're spending much more of your time on technical versus interpersonal challenges. And what gets you noticed, what gets you uh, in the high potential or management, early management ranks is you're good technically. You sell a lot. You're, you know, you're really good. Uh, um, you're a really great uh, production engineer. You're a really good whatever. But you're dealing with technical challenges. So you take a virtuoso who's with technical challenges, and now you say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna develop you as a leader. And as I tell, as I say at least once a week, the higher up you go in the leadership hierarchy, the more you're gonna be concerned with interpersonal challenges, the less with technical challenges. If you talk to the CEO of a publicly held company, what he or she is gonna to wanna to talk, well, to me anyway, they're all interpersonal challenges. Right. And that doesn't mean they don't have big time technical challenges, but they are not dealing with them. Right. They're dealing with how. So, so let's talk about interpersonal challenges, because if you go into a team that is dysfunctional and, and one of the, you know, they call them airplane business books. I always enjoyed uh, five dysfunctions of a team. You know, it's, it's the, it's the leadership. It's a leadership fable. If you haven't read it, it's definitely worth picking up. It's by Patrick Lencioni. Um, Lencioni maybe I, but anyway, it's pretty easy to find. And they sort of have the story of, uh, they come into a dysfunctional team, a new leader comes in and sort of, you know, rebuilds. And, and I think about, um, dysfunctions of teams of which there are many and people don't talk to each other. People don't like each other. There's a big history, but, and, and, and how do you go in and address those challenges that are so obvious to everyone, but you know, yeah, what do you do? Well, first thing is when you say like, like when you say a team's dysfunctional, I don't know, there's some line in literature, famous like opening literature, every family, that's happy is happy in the same way, but every family that's unhappy is unhappy in a different way. I think every team that's dysfunctional is dysfunctional in a different way. Yeah. So my first question is, what are we talking about? And what is the outcome that you want produced that the dysfunction is presenting for you from producing? So where you start with this, what are you up to? Do you not agree on what you're up to you're up to do you not know on what you're up to what you're up to so the first thing is always going to be what's the commitment of the team because a lot of this david especially when you're in this kind of situation you've got to depersonalize it you must depersonalize it and if you got a a, a team and uh they're supposed to do well in a football game, but you got a couple people on there who are golfers, well, you know, then that tells you one thing. But if you if the team's supposed to do well in the Ryder Cup, that tells you another thing. So what exactly are you doing? What are you trying to accomplish? And de the depersonalizing is is really interesting. Because I, I do think, you know, and again, relationships are all about people. And and it's amazing that once a relationship breaks, it's very hard 
to get Very it hard. back. And yet there's some times where where you can't you can't change the team and it's two people or in a group and they, you have to figure out a commonality and the depersonalization is a really is a really good comment on that. I think you nailed it. Common okay. ground. You're, you're the only way out of that abyss or that swamp is finding common ground. You got to find something on. Look, let's agree. Are we up to this or not? And if we are, what are we going to do? I mean, you know, with a team. I mean, the, one of my favorite things I've learned. I mean, look, a team that doesn't, in my opinion, have a shared outcome that they're all committed to isn't a team. Yeah. You know, I've. Let, let's let's talk about that because so so again I, I everything is in the context of COVID and I've talked about this on the podcast before and I think that sometimes people miss COVID has overlaid our business and our society and our economics and our politics and our governments and and in oil and gas it's so prevalent you know for a lot of reasons but but I think that four or five months ago people were really missing how impactful this was like when we moved from flatten the curve this is two weeks to now, and I think I shared this story in, in a comment on LinkedIn, but but the first time, so the Canadian border has been closed and it's that that is how they're managing to keep cases low. And I keep saying the second they open it, like until there's a vaccine, cases are gonna go through the roof and all the data in the world, I, I can't, but they're closed. And it wasn't until this week that I actually missed my parents. And so if they're listening, I do miss them. I've been very frustrated with the Canadian response and I disavow all access to my Canadian heritage, but I miss you now. And I can't see you. And I had a conversation with my father and he said, I don't feel comfortable anymore coming down to see you guys because with the kids activities and the access to people that y'all have, if I get sick, I might die and I can't do that, which basically means, and I hadn't realized this, my father is un accessible to me until there's a vaccine which is probably available at the end of 2021 regardless of the fact they'll have some doses before the election of course but like which means that this is a two-year impact on life which then is a two-year impact on business plans and when you think about like we used to have a common purpose but a lot of people have interpreted a whole bunch of different things. They're home now. They're seeing their family more. They're not traveling as much. They have new priorities. They have all these things. So how do you think that COVID is going to change that common purpose? And the teams that were set up before COVID, are they the teams that need to exist now? And like, what is the long lasting impact? Which that was a very long way to get to that question. But that, that's what comes to mind when you say that. Well, it's a great question. <clears throat> Several, a couple things. So first of all, you can see your dad on Zoom, right? You could see him, right? Right. You could actually, okay. So you could Zoom. So there's a group of people that would say to you, what's the big deal? Just Zoom him. But interesting because people... I haven't Zoomed him since April. Remember when Zoom, like Zoom lunches or whatever were a thing in April and everyone's like, this is, this is stupid. But you're exactly right. I could definitely Zoom him. Now, for some people, that's fine. For me personally, never. In fact, Zooming would probably make me more upset because all it would want me to do is make, want me to be able to go there and hug him more. You know, so, so what did, why did I bring that up? Well, there's a school of thought that says, well, what's, you know, what the heck, virtual, you know, we can do it. We can do mostly everything virtually that we can do, we could do before. So this can go on. This is great. Then there's a school of thought, which I'm in, which is virtual is not the same as in person. That the teams that will do well in the virtual world are the teams that had pre-existing deep relationship. Absolutely. I would say, and I, you can challenge me on this, I think Zoom is great, or I'm using Zoom as video conference. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's worth a hundred billion dollars. Somehow it's like a Facebook app, a FaceTime app, but it's yeah. worth a hundred billion dollars. Don't even get me started on valuation, but yes, yeah, yeah. Zoom. You can, you can transact till the cows come home. So if you're in a, if your job deals with transactions, have at it. Your do, job deals with relationship. We got a different discussion. So um, you can, you, you will not necessarily lose the relationships you had pre-COVID COVID 
using Zoom. But you won't but build new ones. You're not building one. And God help you if you take over a new team and suddenly you got, okay, you can do it. You're going to have to do it. You don't particularly have a choice. But I'm taking over a new team. My advice is you figure out when the first moment is you can get all those people in a room and you do it. Yeah. And you don't have to keep them in the room forever and you don't have to, you know, but you're, I'm sorry, you're not, you're not going to accomplish the same thing. And if you are a person who the video of the helicopter tour of Kauai is the same thing as being in the helicopter in Kauai, you can, you're going to be virtual forever. If you're a person who wants the something else, has a different view of experience, uh, um, you're going to be in a different camp. I'm, you know, look, it's tough for me because I'm an in-person with am my too. clients. I learned so much by being, I mean, look, David, just, just, when, just when I go in somebody's office, I learn all kinds of stuff about them. Yeah, and I learned. You know, how did I get there? Did I have to go through security? So the Zoom thing, okay, but um, you know, uh, well, and it's 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 really cool. I mean, so I I, I had Vicky Hollib on the podcast last week, and 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 I asked her about how work from home was going, and and it was really I loved her response because of, and I I mean I love her as a person. I think she's very genuine and authentic, and one of the things I loved about her response was this worked for nine months. But this is not consistent with our ability to manage change and to implement things. And we are missing that interpersonal relationship stuff. And, and I think about the people I've worked with over my life. It was the time away from the office or working in the office on a project together that built the relationship that lasted forever. And some of my absolute best friends, even when I don't talk to them, some of my absolute best friends are the people that I had that joint experience with. When I was playing squash as a kid and I was on the national team, like my best friends in the world were, were that I was training with hanging out with, traveling with, existing with, we had the same challenges and we knew it. And there's no way we could do that virtually. And so when we think about work from home and everyone says, oh, the new normal, I don't think, I, I honest to God don't believe companies work virtually. They can work for a time virtually, but I just do not believe that this is a thing that is sustainable for any term kind of long-term performance. And it sounds like you feel the same way. It sounded like Vicky felt the same way. Absolutely. I do not think it's sustainable, but I have a lot of people arguing with me about it. So, you know, we shall, we shall see. We shall and, see. And, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, there's a funny analogy, but, uh, my, my younger son is, um, he's uh, taken a year off from college because it's, college is all virtual. And, and I, wanna, I wanna talk about that because it's a great tie to the virtual school. And, and yeah. I remember, so your son, your son is at Harvard, if I remember. He's, a, he's got, he's got he's a, he's a, I guess you call him a rising senior at Harvard. He happens, to, and, in one, and his, he plays lacrosse. So that's a big commitment for him. So Harvard decreed that only the freshmen could go back to campus and even the freshmen have to go virtual, all virtual. So you're going to be in a single and you're going to be on, in Cambridge, but you're going to be doing all your classes virtually and, um, um, and made it for a whole, whole, in a whole host of ways really difficult for people to go back. So he had the choice of um, doing all his, doing a senior year essentially online. Um, but in the spring, lacrosse is, of course, a spring sport. It's highly doubtful there will be a season. Okay. Highly doubtful. So he said, okay, I'm going to take a year off. I'm going to work. As we speak, he's in an RV. He's in an RV with eight of his teammates. Um, RV, nine guys in an RV that sleep seven. Go figure. But when you're- Hey, it's, college, it's college. I it's mean, college. <laughs> that's what you do. Yeah. And they are- uh, uh, you know, Sunday they were hiking Telluride and mountain biking in Telluride, and then they went to the Grand Canyon, and now they're in Tahoe or wherever they are. I don't know. But, okay, could you see all those places virtually? No. Of course you could. You, 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 I could look at video, but 
the experience of it, forget it. And and those forget and, it. and those nine people, the relationship that they will build through this experience. This is the thing that came out of COVID for me that that I I was very surprised by. And and I remember coming like when I was growing up and and when my wife was growing up, like my wife wanted to take a gap year after like grade twelve and go travel in Europe, which was a thing to do in the seventies, but then like really wasn't in the eighties, is what I sort of saw. And her dad said, "You can do that, but I'm not paying for college." So needless to say she was in college in in the September and I think back to it now and I wonder if it's about the civil unrest that might have happened in the 60s post-war and 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 the, the whole awakening but we're back to a place now where I don't know the world that my kids are going into but I know that racing to get through university and into college like to me seems absolutely futile and if I had to go to college online I would be apoplectic and so I, I, I guess I give Harvard and others credit for allowing people to take a gap year. And I give huge credit to those who take a gap year to experience the world and mature in a way that isn't school related in a year that really is like, quite frankly, the worst year in history, um, or at least at least in recent history. And, yeah. and I'm curious, I mean, what, what has, it, has it changed your views? Like, I'm sure you would have like rolled your eyes if your kid wanted to take a, a gap year between third and fourth and they told you two years ago. Yeah, well, um, the whole thing forced me, in my case, to look at what are you really paying for? And really what, in my opinion, what I'm paying for is an experience and a brand. And that's what you're paying for at Harvard. Yeah. Having lost a brand really can't use it because the kids who are doing their senior year online, they graduate, they haven't lost the brand. Um, um, but the experience, there's no way. And that's really why that institution is where it is. It provides a particular experience. Now, there's aspects of it that are crazy. Harvard certainly didn't want people taking time off. They discouraged it. They said, for example, if you're a freshman and you take a year off, you're not guaranteed housing when you come back in Harvard Yard because we're taking a full class. And oh, by the way, you lose your financial aid and you're gonna have to reapply for financial aid if you come back. Of course That's they a did. Disincent of That's course a disincentive. That's a disincentive. And still 20% of the incoming freshman class elected to defer. So it's, and they're gonna have to be, you know, gonna be a great market for apartments in Cambridge come next September. So uh, when they have to all find them. So, um, so I think that um, it's, it's, it forces you to really look at, you know, compounded by Harvard gave hardly any break on the tuition. Right. I mean, oh, they gave you no break on the tuition. They uh, didn't charge you for room and board. Then they added a whole bunch of student activity fees. Go figure. Yeah, and, uh, that you can't uh, actually do. So, so, but, but, you know, but, but I, I mean, look, it's a phenomenal experience. I'm deeply grateful for it. He's deeply grateful for it. I wouldn't, you know, uh, but, but you have to say, what really am I doing here? And I think a lot of us parents of all, you know, all um, um, in all stages of your kids' ages, you really have to ask the question. Well, and, and I think that this goes, this goes around to something that I've talked about a lot on the blog is the cost of university at 75000 or whatever times four years is $300,000 after tax, which is $500,000 before tax. And that's just rough numbers. And when you think about the jobs that can repay $500,000 of tuition, they're becoming less and less and less. And then you take the experience away. And, and so when I think about the new normal and the things that are going to come out of COVID, you know, I think that you're going to see a lot more families end up living together for much longer. The concept of an 18 year old leaving the house, going to college and never coming home. I actually kind of see that you're going to see multi-generational families because quite frankly, many people are going to lose their house. I think the colleges are going to totally change because you're like, what am I paying $75,000 for a liberal arts degree or whatever it is to come out and never be able to pay it back? and they wanted me to be online and I lived in a different city and like the, the only reason that they had access to these loans was because the government program was doing it because the schools were like encouraging it and 
all so to me the new normal is people's priorities and and i think that colleges i'd be shocked if 50 percent of colleges in the united states don't close in the next 10 years yeah they're under enormous financial pressure even harvard there was a forbes article even harvard felt the hit yeah and so um you know they uh they didn't expect the 20 percent to defer they uh you know they, they thought they'd have 40 percent of their you know they 40% of the campus would be occupied. Instead, it's only 25. So it is, there is definitely financial pressure. I mean, the, the, the one thing you said that, I, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. The one thing I'm uncomfortable with about COVID is I, again, pure hypothesis. I think this multi-generational family thing, I think you're right. I don't think this is good for society. Oh, I, I totally, I totally agree with you. Um, I do think, though, especially given that 50% of deaths in the United States were in nursing homes, and yeah. in some states it was much higher, there is something about, you, you know, again, now, it, it, it leads to living in the suburbs, having bigger houses, and quite frankly, having a house that's like adjacent to your house so mm -hmm. that your parents can live there so they don't drive you friggin' crazy. But right. but I, I agree. This is it's definitively not good for society, which is, which brings us to the sort of the next topic that we sort of touched on a little bit. But but the the politics of this and and how how do you as an executive coach come into a company where there's divisiveness because. Everything is now divided on political lines. And even friends of mine who I've been friends with for a decade that are deeply left and we just were able to avoid the topic, we now it's slapping us right square in the face and we don't agree on anything. And, yeah. and it's very hard for us to even be friends and get along. And it's broken a lot of relationships. And I'm finding that I'm gravitating more to people like me than I used to where I would, it was a mix of everybody. And so I'm curious how, when you overlay that backdrop in the business place and you overlay an election that is probably, you know, certainly one of the most important elections we've ever had. And, and it, it goes right down to like, this isn't even about the candidates. This is not Biden versus Trump. This no, is not, not, this isn't even Republican versus Democrat. This is an, and to steal your phrase, cause I know you, you told me about it, but this is capitalism versus socialism. And the way you vote is what you believe. Yeah, yeah. I, I, well, let me take this a couple things. So first of all, I think arguably one of the greatest changes for senior leaders in the last two to four years is suddenly you've got this whole other domain you got to be con you got to be concerned with called politics and political this and that. It used to be you could be apolitical. You could. You mean as a leader of an organization? As a leader, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you were, you were, your best bet was to be apolitical because you were uh, leading a diverse group of people with a diverse group of opinions, and the market did not call upon you to take um, political stands. But slowly but surely, uh, this stuff started to creep in corporate social responsibility, sustainability. Now you've got to be concerned with all that. On top of leading all people with very strongly held opinions that are divergent, on top of being hyper-concerned with what you say, and let's not even get into what you might have said 20 years ago in your yearbook. So you have got to be hyper-careful, hyper-cautious, and the big thing I hate about this is the share of mind that it takes for a CEO to deal with this is a share of mind that should better be devoted to the maximizing, you know, the return. I, I believe in shareholder returns. So I'm going to say maximizing shareholder or even stakeholder yeah, return. Right. So that's the thing that it sucks it right out of you. And, 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 and and, and you you touch on it exactly, and, and Vicky talked about it now too, is that leading an organization and being a CEO is much, much harder today than it was. And it's one of the reasons that when, when her and I talked about executive compensation, that generally she left a career that she would have had a much longer career, a little out of the spotlight, doing more technical roles and being paid very well, and jumped into a role where really the tenure is kind of four years, and then you know, you're kind of done. Now, of course, they recycle CEOs, but I, I still even think in energy, you're going to see less and less of that. And yeah. and it is, it's a totally different world, but but people have been weighing in. And, and on the ESG side, I remember that, that, that CEO roundtable, and perhaps you remember it from two years ago. And 
they they sort of said we no longer believe that shareholder return is the most important thing and we think that it's all these other things it's like you know community value and i was like what is going on with the with the world like the goal of a company the only reason it exists is to make profit like really and we've moved into this huge world but we have these monoliths like amazon like google like microsoft that are like apple that are ha that those five companies are half the market and and their ceos are basically presidents of countries because, because they have the the same revenue as like countries in europe it, it is amazing how the world has changed for a ceo and what they have to do yeah absolutely i mean their their job is tougher they always had to have the widest possible peripheral vision of anyone now it's even it's even more peripheral and so um i just think it's just i mean they're in a tough spot um does, does it change does it change the way you approach i mean when, when you have to deal with all these issues and politics are they're they're very clearly there how do you coach leaders on dealing with some of these sensitive topics because you know people don't like to talk about sensitive topics and like the work from home thing has so much well i don't feel safe then you have people who are taking advantage of it then you have people who are like well you can leave the office whenever you want but when i'm there i have to be there from eight to five i kind of like not being monitored like this and being able to drive my kids what do you mean we have to go back to work i'm not i didn't sign up for that level like how do you coach leaders on that topic now well, right now, the honest answer is my first thing is proceed with extreme caution. My second thing is either keep your mouth shut or choose your words very carefully because you must. And be hyper careful about anything you joke about. You need to be very, very, very careful because that whole world has changed. You can say something to someone, I've seen this. You say something to someone, that person's not offended. That person tells someone else what you said, that person's not offended. That third person tells someone else, God knows if it's the same thing, and the third person is offended, you now have a problem. Yeah. We, which Believe it, it or not. It's crazy. I mean, it, and it, it's totally true. You're right. And Believe it or not. Yeah. And um, um, <clears throat> um, and the other thing about this, um, this whole thing in corporations, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of suspicious because as follows. And um, uh, I saw a podcast by a gentleman named Vivek Ramaswamy, and he made what I thought was a superb point. And what he said was, in the federal government, you have the judicial legislative and executive branches and those are supposedly the branches of the government but what you also have is the administrative state they're they're technically under the executive but they're accountable to no one and so they do what they want when they want and they are they do not like it when somebody not of the brotherhood comes in and tries to shake things up they're going to fight that to the death yeah because they're like i've been here for 10 years you don't know what you're doing you're out of here in two there's no way i want to do that and yeah. so you have this glue we just of, wait you out we yeah. wait you out you also see it in the uh, armed forces where a new general comes in and the rank and file just wait him out or her out yeah in companies the correlate to the administrative class is the managerial class the manager class, they're not, you know, they typically, they may own a little bit of stock, but they don't really own, they're there to run the company. They may yeah. have a piece of stock. But they get sad. They're there for their salary. Yeah. And the so, power. Yeah. So a manager, so you're supposed to make, I think, you're supposed to make return for the owners. But wait, 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 wait. Well, we have to broaden our perspective to take into account the community, the, 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 da, 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 da. And here's the punchline, David. When you're accountable to everybody, you are accountable to, to nobody. nobody. To nobody. That's 100%. And, and that's and, what I think. See, that's what you got. Well, and, and, and you see, you definitely see it. And I see it in oil and gas. To bring this back to oil and gas is that like companies who are talking about capital programs now are the managers who know that if they're not doing capital programs, they are going to lose their job. 
and yep. they care more about their job, which is, I look, the, the, the empathy part of me, which is very, very small, but it exists. The empathy part of me says, I get it because at the end of the day, people work to be able to afford their retirement, their boats, hang out with their kids, and they want to manage their career. And so for people who are at the tail end of their career, who are managers, who realize that if they don't bring forward capital activities, they will lose their job. You're having this massive momentum, whereas the CEO is like, I have a whole bunch of stock and we're going to go bankrupt if we spend this. So I really don't want to do it, but I also don't want to fire all my friends. And so they, they're in this unbelievably tough spot. And I'm sure that they're in there in the airlines, in restaurants, yeah. hospitality. I mean, pick your business that's been negatively impacted by COVID and none of them have made the drastic cuts. And I always say, boy, the COVID hasn't even been felt yet. And until so October... When PPP expires, when budgets are done, because budgets are being done in August and September, and people actually look and say, the world is not getting better. Demand is not coming back. I hoped it was, but it isn't. I need to make layoffs. The real pain of COVID to the economy, to Main Street, comes in October, November in my world. And and that is the scariest part for CEOs to have to navigate. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. And, um, you know, uh, um, there are some, I mean, it, the gap between the haves and the have nots is widening. Oh, or, I, and, I, and, I, I, and that's where I want to end our conversation. And I really appreciate you, you triggering that because I was having an argument last night. I'm not even going to call it an argument, but, but, uh, a, a young woman I have known forever. And I hope she's listening. Cause we are, I'm going to take you for dinner. We're going to have a longer chat than we had last night, but she's 24. And she was in a group, we're all white, it was just we are. And um, my 15 year old son was there who's like actually more conservative than me, if that's even possible. He listens to Ben Shapiro and his is his favorite commentator. So I'm like, oh boy, if he's starting out Republican at 15, I don't even want to know where he's going to be at 30. Correct. But anyway, so my friend at 24 was talking about racism, BLM, all this, all these big topics. And, and one of the things that I said about it was that the current world, right? We want to give, and I, I'm going to sound very controversial. We want to give excuses for why people aren't where they are. And 100% it's opportunity. And so people in the 1900s who made it wealthy, their generations after them were wealthy. They had more opportunities for education, to run businesses, to buy businesses, to go through the boom. Then those boomers had kids who then had access to wealth, who had access to opportunity, who then have done something. Whereas there's other people who don't have access to the opportunity. But in talking about all the BLM, we are taking away meritocracy. And like LeBron James was the example I used. Most white people would think of LeBron James as not a black person or a white person, they think of them as a successful person. And so like we, we, we've been trying to divide up, well, racism prevents this and there's systemic this and there's, to me, it's we value successful people and we don't value unsuccessful people. And somehow this racism chat has, has totally moved us away from, from opportunity and skill and merit. And we have this, and I'm, I'm curious what you think about that and ties to your kids and, and education and all the whole society. Well, I think that America is the land of opportunity, equal op opportunity. It's a land of opportunity. So it's equal opportunity. You need to provide opportunity. It's not the land of equal outcomes. And the I think it boils down to, and we could have a long discussion about Black Lives Matter and, you know, based based in a Marxist philosophy that wants to, and that's why, you know, socialism and the whole thing. But fundamentally, you what you want, what, what, what it's equality of opportunity or equality of outcome. Now, here's the problem with equality of outcome. And Jordan Peterson nailed this when he said, if people are free, they are not equal. If people are equal, they are not free. So one of the problems with, I think, a fundamental problem with guaranteeing equality of outcome, because, you know, the, the whole theory here is the role of hierarchy is the oppressor 
oppresses the oppressed. And so that leads to unequal outcomes. Therefore, we got to change that. And so, you know, and hierarchies built into language. So we have to speak differently, enter political correctness. And oh, by the way, everything's relative against your cultural backdrop and so on and so forth. The problem we're going to have to confront is if you want to guarantee equality of outcomes, which by the way, I don't think you can, um, <clears throat> you're going to lose freedom. And I'm afraid we're starting to see the beginnings of that. And, you know, I'll say something controversial. Winston Churchill said, socialism is the philosophy of failure, the creed of ignorance, and the gospel of envy. And I'm afraid that's where we're, you know, I, that's what I see that I don't like. Well, and that's, and that is, I think the core of the discussion is the haves versus the have nots. And what I was trying, and I think you articulated it in a really effective way, which is the, the equality of, of outcomes is not there. And so when we think about everything that society should be doing, in my opinion, we should be doing everything to provide opportunity and opportunity comes with education and opportunity yes. comes with parent engagement. And so two things. Number one, if the parents aren't engaged and then those people are now 25 and they're protesting about how they didn't have an opportunity, to me, that's on the parents. Because I know, you know, one of the one of the women that worked with my family, yes, it's it was a nanny when I was young. I don't think this is a surprise. But she worked four jobs to put her two kids through college. One is a nurse, one is an engineer. And she absolutely worked her ass off to give her kids a better life. That's that's called opportunity for your your kin. It's not opportunity for you. And it takes a hundred years to make everyone in your chain better. But you just don't get it like right now. And so what I'm seeing in this haves versus have nots is the parents that were volunteering at school, that were running the school auction, that were donating money, donating time, having their kids who are also good citizens be with kids who are less fortunate in the public school system. What are those parents doing? They're pulling their kids from school. They're hiring the best teachers that aren't in a union to teach them at home with their friends who also can afford that or putting them in private schools and the opportunities that are going to be given to the other people who don't have access to those parents and those resources, the, the, the gap is going to be so massive because of what we've done and, and the, the systemic hatred that we're building into the system where I'm like, I don't see it as systemic racism. I see it as systemic lack of opportunity. And sometimes you have to live in the bed you, you made. Some kids come out of the projects and make the NBA. And if that's what their goal was and they don't make it, there's a lot of kids that now work at Amazon because they didn't focus on education. They picked their horse, they lost, and that's the way society's supposed to work. Now, that might sound, you know, elitist and, you know, you're white and you had all these opportunities, so you don't know what I'm talking about. But that's the challenge that I see. And I, I think you see it as well. No, I do. As I, I, think I, 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 think, I think we may have talked about this, but I think America is the land of opportunity. And what enables America to be the land of opportunity is the public education system. And if we lose the public education system, we have lost our national soul. So I am a big believer in the educational system, but here's the deal. The problem, and I see this with my daughter, the schools are being asked to address a whole host of issues that have, don't have anything to do with education. Thomas Sowell wrote, you gotta have, the, you gotta have parents having their kids show up at school ready to learn. That means they had breakfast, they da 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 da, you know. And if they show up at school and they're not ready to learn, how is the, to ask teachers to deal with all that is difficult at best, but then the res response to that is, but if teachers don't deal with it, who will? So I don't know. I am very worried about the educational system and um, I don't know what the solution is. I do personally think part of the solution is school choice, but certainly not the entire solution by any stretch of the imagination. And um, I do think that uh, 
we've got to be willing to live with unequal outcomes to be a free society, but we also can't ignore the problem of the, the haves getting more and the have-nots getting less, but, the re but then we get to what's the remedy? I like capitalism to remedy that. I don't like socialism. And it's no accident we had the best, the lowest unemployment rate in history previous to COVID. Yeah. So that's that's going to be really the that that I think is the um, that's the big thing in the election that I worry about. I worry about the solution to uh, inequality is going to be the socialist philosophy, which is going to exacerbate <clears throat> versus cure versus excuse me cure the problem. Well, it, I mean, and it comes full cycle back to uh, Ayn Rand's book, Atlas Shrugged, and that the more you have clamping down through regulations and trying to afford equal opportunity to everyone, those who have built and create will find a different place to build and create, and it will not be there. And so when I look at even just state to state, when California and New York are raising taxes on their most, most wealthy and most productive members, those wealthy and productive members are going to discover that there are other places to live that are a lot more accommodating, which then exacerbates the budget problems in those states. So we, we have a world of challenge. And um, I really, really appreciate you coming on today because I think we covered a lot of stuff. I love the Myers-Briggs piece, but then tying it all back with self-awareness and how everything is, everything is intertwined. What, what advice would you give to those listening about how they could be better and, and maybe deal with whatever it is they're dealing with, whatever challenges that they're dealing with right now? What advice would you give them? Great question, because I'm working on this myself. Um, let's see. I think that you've got it. First thing is stay connected. Stay connected to as many, you know, people and organizations and uh, uh, stay connected. Read stuff. Just read stuff. Read good stuff. Uh, um, or listen to stuff. Listen to good stuff. You know, I mean, uh, you no longer have to turn on, you know, you, can, you don't have to read the New York Times, Washington Post, or whatever. You can, you can find plenty of great material online. Stay connected. Read stuff. And here's the third thing that I would say, and this, I think, is far and away the most important. Be grateful for what you have. Live in a world, be grateful for what you have. Because here's one of the things I can tell you for sure. As bad as you think, well, first of all, if you're listening to this podcast, you're in the top, I don't know, 0.001% of the people in the world because you can listen to this. So I think it's often all too easy to forget how lucky we are to live in the United States of America and, um, and have what we have. So I would say stay connected, read, and be grateful for what you have. Because I think just as you get, you, know, you get more of what you focus on, I think if you focus on gratitude, life seems to go up and to the right more. I love that. Well, Dick, I thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank and, you for uh, having me, man. It's great. I, I got a lot of value out of it. And I hope our listeners did too. Until the next episode, be safe, be good, have a great day, and bye.